Welcome to today's webinar, Intimate Partner Violence Involving Lesbian, Gay, and Bisexual Individuals, A Look at National Data. My name is Susan Howley, and I am the Project Director for the Center for Victim Research. We're so glad you all joined us today. The Center for Victim Research and this webinar are supported by funding from OVC, and the subject of today's webinar was supported by funding of the National Institutes of Justice, Institute of Justice. But the opinions, findings, and conclusions or recommendations expressed in this presentation are those of the contributors and do not necessarily represent the official position or policies of the U.S. Department of Justice. Just a word about the center. The CVR is a partnership between researchers and practitioners at the Justice Research and Statistics Association, the National Center for Victims of Crime, and the Urban Institute. We try to serve as a one-stop resource for victim service providers and researchers to connect and share knowledge, to increase access to victim research and data, and increase the utility of research and data collection to victim services nationwide. Today's webinar is designed to provide access to a slice of current data and help you think about what it means for services. And now it is my pleasure to welcome our presenters today. Lynn Addington, Professor at the Department of Justice, Law, and Criminology at American University, and Erica Dixon, National Capacity Building Coordinator at the National Coalition of Antiviolence Programs, which is a program of the New York, New York City Antiviolence Project. Welcome, and I will turn the controls over to Lynn. I had to unmute myself there. So can every, I hope everyone can hear me? Yes, we can. Thanks, Excellent. Lynn. Excellent. Great. Thank you so much. And I wanted to thank Susan and also the CVR for uh, welcoming me and Erica as uh, participants. And I'm also looking forward to sharing this time with all of you who've uh, joined us today, especially so many new people to the webinar uh, series. This is great. And I have to say just one additional thing about uh, my background or my uh, interest in this area. One of the things I'm very interested in is connecting research with practice and policy. And I view this as a collaboration and a mutual learning experience. So that's why I'm thrilled to be sharing this time and this webinar with Erica Dixon. And I'll be bringing Erica in to, um, for her feedback and commentary as we progress with the webinar. So we'll go ahead and get started here with uh, some goals of the webinar. And these are the goals that we have today. Uh, it's basically, it's kind of designed as an overview. And I know we have a great deal of people who signed up for the webinar with a range of backgrounds and knowledge. So I'm hoping we'll kind of pitch it a good, uh, a good area here to include information for everyone. Everyone will walk away with some, some new findings and new thinking about, uh, about data and uh, statistics in this, in this area. And before I launch in uh, the webinar and talking, again, more about the, the national data sources and the pluses and minuses of these data and how, how you all might be using them uh, for your work uh, with uh, intimate partner um, victims and uh, the work that you all do, I wanted to give a context and a bit of a motivation for what I'm doing or the, the project behind this work. And many of you are familiar with uh, OVC's Vision 21 report uh, that identified a lot of issues and uh, strengths that we needed to, to really further the work that all of us do with victims, no matter whether we're researchers, practitioners, or policymakers. And one issue that they identified was looking at um, underserved and understudied victim groups. And they indicated one need was to understand what information can be obtained from existing data sources to see both the limitations of those data as well as make recommendations for improvement since the idea was that this information would help support policy um, and, um, investment and also funding for other data collections uh, in order to better support these victims. And a couple years ago, NIJ had a call for proposals to support this work. And this is kind of the genesis and the, the acknowledgement uh, early on about the funding for this project. Although I have to say one caveat is that a reason that many of these groups are, are understudied is because they aren't well captured in our existing national data sources. And so um, you'll, you'll probably notice there's some limitations with what we have in the data that I'm presenting today, uh, but it's important to understand what we have that's out there so we can build upon that. Um, as you know, that many of these groups, especially our marginalized populations, tend to be underrepresented 
underrepresented in our data sources. And um, that's for a variety of reasons, but uh, one of them is that you know, we, we do need to do a better job of updating and refreshing our data systems to incorporate new knowledge and research and also uh, learning about uh, groups that are underserved. So that's just a little bit of a context for what we're doing in this uh, webinar and the, the, the motivation behind it. And a bit of an overview of the presentation. We're going to be looking at uh, giving a little bit of background about uh, the research and what we know about um, IPV in, involving uh, uh, lesbian, gay, and bisexual individuals. A little bit of a description of the national data sources. I'm going to give some illustrations of how these sources can inform um, learning about IPV uh, in this area. And we'll go and leave some time for uh, discussion and, and, and additional questions. Uh, one thing I do want to say before we get started is that um, I wanted to make a, a, note, a bit of a caveat with regard to uh, the terminology I will use. I do tend to use the word victim uh, rather than survivor, although I do appreciate that some of you all use different terminology, so that's just one of my uh, things I wanted to mention. Again, it's not to dismiss other people's uh, views of those terms, it's just what I, what I particularly use. I will use the terminology intimate partner violence rather than domestic violence. Again, acknowledging that, that there's other uh, 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 preferences in the field. And I am focusing on lesbian, gay, and bisexual individuals. Again, given the limits that we have with these nat national data sources, um, we don't have, a, really don't have any data to look at um, uh, trans and non-conforming, non-binary uh, uh, individuals. But um, I also wanted to give a little bit of a discussion about that. I know Erica wanted to add a little bit of some commentary about, about that terminology and also the, the issues of uh, domestic violence versus in that partner violence. Hey, thank you, Lynn, and thank you, um, CBR, and uh, everyone for welcoming me on to this webinar. I'm really excited to um, chat with you all. I think that it'll be a really good balance um, between Lynn's expertise in data and research, and um, I'm more of working uh, directly with survivors and also um, working with um, smaller organizations that are community-based and um, really grounded in uh, direct service provision. Um, so I'm really excited for um, the webinar today. And I did want to just talk a little bit about um, the survivor versus um, using victim, and when I'm speaking, I will be using survivor more. Um, NCAVP, in particular, a lot of other smaller anti-violence projects, we really take the language that we use from the community that we work with, and a lot of community that we work with does use the terminology survivor. Um, so that's just my preference um, that I'll be using, and again, everyone has their own preference, um, we just wanted to put that out there. Um, and also with intimate partner violence and domestic violence, um, the anti-violence kind of world and movement has definitely moved towards using IPV um, instead of DV, kind of recognizing the history of domestic violence um, kind of being, or the domestic violence movement being rooted in the heterosexual kind of married relationship, um, and IPV is seen as kind of a more broad and inclusive term for the types of relationships and the types of violence that can potentially occur within those relationships. Um, so I just wanted to highlight those two things for right now. Great, thanks so much, Erica. And I, again, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm thrilled to have you part of this, uh, giving your, um, your expertise I think this is this is excellent uh, an excellent partnership uh, here that we're doing for the webinar. So I'm looking forward yeah. to it Thank you so much. So um, I'll go on to the looking at a little bit about the background here, and um, so what we know about um, IPV with regard to sexual minorities, and this comes from existing research as well as the Visions 21 report kind of highlighted this, and other reviews of the research have kind of made similar uh, indications about some of the limitations in the area. And as some of you may know, um, with regard to IPV, there's been a, a, just a, a large amount of research that, that's been conducted in the area. This tends to be focused, um, as, as Erica, kind of, Erica kind of alluded to, with regard to the, the heterosexual um, community and has not really focused on uh, sexual minorities. They remain an understudied uh, group, even though we've been expanding the amount of IPV work that's out there. I, I make note of this, this one review of the research that indicated only 3% of IPV 
IPV articles over a 15 year period focused on LGB IPV. So you can see the just the really um, a lot more work needs to be done in this area to better inform uh, research uh, policy and also the practitioner community. Uh, and, all, and one of the things that is indicated with the work that has been done, one of the groups that has received the least amount of attention in this area, um, and again, I'm focusing on the, the LGB area. I know there's uh, also similar uh, limitations with regard to, to trans and, and uh, non-conforming, uh, non-binary individuals. But uh, within the LGB area, bisexual individuals have received the least amount of research attention. So we really um, know the least about that, those groups of uh, those, those individuals and their experiences with IPV. And what we also don't know a lot about is comparing across sexual orientation to see uh, differences and similarities um, in experiences, also um, research or resource needs and that sort of thing. And then uh, finally, a few studies rely on national data or representative samples. And I wanted to make a quick note of this because I know we have a variety of, of backgrounds uh, with regard to uh, data and issues of sampling. And I just wanted to make note of uh, what, what I mean by that. And basically, as, as, all, as you all know, that we can't include everyone in, in, in studies. So we, we have to sample people. And frequently in the sexual minority IPV research area, we tend to see what they call purposive, or maybe sometimes you hear that called convenient samples. And they're based on um, individuals, for example, individuals uh, accessing services or who might be part of a identified social or advocacy or support group. Um, the idea is that uh, researchers are trying to identify uh, people who would uh, 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 identify themselves as um, lesbian, gay, uh, bisexual, uh, trans, and other contexts, that sort of thing. So they're trying to identify these individuals. So they'll go to these uh, various uh, uh, services or, or groups to get, uh, to get their samples. And they'd have the benefit of identifying um, sexual minority individuals or those who are IPV victims or survivors. Um, but the problem is, is that they're likely different than people who maybe weren't seeking services or who maybe don't affiliate with, those, with a particular group. And so what we really want to do is be able to generalize our findings to a larger population. And so that's where our representative sampling or relying on uh, national data to get you know, larger samples of uh, individuals really comes into play there. And we don't see that as much in the um, LGB uh, area, and that's been kind of limited the generalizability of the findings that the re existing research um, has. And then um, finally, one of the limitations too, as I mentioned, is that we don't have a lot of uh, comparison across either both uh, within sexual minority groups, so looking at comparisons between uh, lesbian, gay, and bisexual individuals, and also looking how those groups compare with uh, heterosexual um, IPV victims, both to see uh, specific needs of the various communities, possible barriers that might differ, and also to see are there shared resource opportunities. So without those comparisons, we really don't have that kind of information. And finally, I mentioned that there aren't a lot of national organizations that focus on IPV within the um, LGBTQ community, but one of them is Erica's. And I don't know, Erica, did you want to make a few words, take a few words about your organization? Sure. Um, so the National Coalition of Anti-Violence Programs um, is a coalition of about 50 local um, anti-violence um, organizations across the country. Um, and an anti-violence organization um, generally is, a, like I said, a community-based organization that serves LGBTQ, um, sometimes HIV-infected um, or affected um, communities, um, and works to provide services, advocacy, legal, um, legal advocacy, um, doing policy, doing trainings. Um, this is a variety of different services that local AVPs provide and the coalition kind of brings everyone together um, to really work on the national front, um, especially in policy. So we work a lot on uh, the Violence Against Women Act reauthorization, the Family Violence Prevention Act reauthorization, both of which are, we're trying to get reauthorized this year. <laughs> um, and we also do um, reports, national reports. And um, like Lynn said, it's really 
challenging to get national data um, on LGBTQ and HIV affected communities, um, but we're trying our best. And um, the data that we collect is from the local organizations, um, so folks that they serve, folks that call into hotline, um, and also incidents that happen in community that people hear about. Um, we collect all of that data from organizations that submit to us, and every year we publish um, data specifically on hate violence and then data on IPV. Um, and we can, I think we'll send that around um, at the end or later on um, the most recent report. And we're also part of the National LGBTQ Institute on IPV, <laughs> so many acronyms. Um, and the Institute really, we work to create like best practices and do a lot of TA and training with both mainstream organizations and um, LGBTQ specific organizations um, around better service provision and making sure that LGBTQ folks have access to, um, to the best quality uh, services that um, we can. <laughs> um, and we do a lot around trying to um, improve research and data collection and there are a lot of uh, resources that we'll share around um, from the Institute as well after. Excellent. Great. Thank you so much, Erica. That's, I definitely wanted to make sure that people um, got some information since the, uh, there are a lot of organizations and your organization does so many um, terrific things with the LGBTQ community. So I wanted to make sure everyone uh, knew about your, your group if they, if they didn't already. Um, so what, uh, what we do know, so looking at the research that we actually do have with regard to LG, um, I'm sorry, IPV among LGB individuals, um, I'll kind of show this slide, but I know Erica wanted to bring in some of her um, experience from her work uh, that uh, looking at kind of an overview of um, IPV, especially in the, in the queer community. So Erica, I'll, I'll, put, you, I'll put you on again to, to pro provide some of that uh, background. Yeah, um, so I think we'll talk a little bit more in depth about um, kind of how we see IPV in um, kind of the AVP world and how data and like NISPIS and all of the other um, kind of databases that Lynn will talk about um, kind of measures IPV. Um, but I just kind of wanted to um, highlight the Sorry, I'm looking at my notes here. Yeah, um, just highlight the fact that when we're talking about um, this data and keeping in mind um, this is specific to LGB, yes, LGB folks um, and data on uh, trans and gender nonconforming and non-binary folks, the data that we do have shows that violence is incredibly high, especially um, within or against um, communities of color, um, folks who have disabilities, folks who are immigrants or undocumented. Um, so just kind of keeping in mind um, the folks that aren't being captured in this data and um, how IPVs could be playing out in those um, contexts, then we're not even able to capture that. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to kind of bring that in and I can talk a little bit more about like the specifics of how we look at IPV um, a little bit later. Okay, great, Erica. And I think that's a really yep. important point, especially the, um, what we would, might call the multiple minority status of uh, people who have sexual minorities uh, with regard to IPV and then also if it's um, their person of color, if they're, as, as you said, immigration status, that's sort of I think is um, disability status that, that all um, can make it uh, even more challenging and even more at, at risk uh, for, for IPV as well as other types of violence we're focusing on, uh, on IPV right here. So um, I wanted to go on and say um, with the talk a little bit about and I think this slide might be a little bit obvious for everyone who's participating because obviously you know why you, you're here because you're interested in learning about uh, data and uh, I think oftentimes people think oh that's for, for researchers but I wanted to highlight a few uh, points about um, learning about uh, data and, and why it's important and including the, the first box here which talks about uh, generating research and I want for those of you who might not be as familiar some of you might be um, 
up to speed on some of these things, but just to get everyone in, in the loop here, that uh, there's a growing availability of online tools, which uh, really increases access to analyzing data. It used to be that you had to be connected with a, a university or be able to access statistical software or something like that. And now there's a, a, there's a growing number of platforms that those who are producing the data, so I'm talking about the FBI, I'm talking about the Bureau of Justice Statistics, um, other groups such as the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention, um, they're all creating uh, online tools so that you can analyze uh, data and create your own uh, frequencies, tables, uh, kind of uh, information that might either help inform the work you do or if you're applying for funding or something like that, that you're able to, to provide that type, get that kind of information and, and access it more readily than it has been available in the past. It's a bit beyond what we're doing at, uh, in, right now for this seminar to, or this webinar to talk about those tools, but if we get into discussion later and people want to know more about that, I'm happy to, to talk to them and we'll also have my contact information later. I'd be happy to uh, direct you to those, those resources. And also, I think you know, many of you indicated on the pre-webinar uh, survey that you already are in, uh, getting information via government reports or fact sheets and blogs. And of course, it's helpful to understand where some of these data are coming from and what are the pluses and minuses so that you know what the data can and cannot say, what it would, what's useful to you for. And finally, to be a knowledgeable partner, there's a growing interest. Uh, one of them is from the Visions 21 and also the Center for uh, Victim Research to collaborate, uh, have collaborations between researchers and uh, practitioners and, and policymakers. And these really should be mutually beneficial to you and so to be a knowledgeable partner. And um, I wanted to bring Erica back in here to talk a little bit about that because I think she has some really important points about, um, you know, kind of collaborating with researchers and some uh, some just precautions to, to talk about there. Yeah, thanks. Um, so one of the things that we're really working on at the um, IPV Institute is really pushing um, participatory action research and um, really developing best practices around um, working with communities and making sure that research is, like Lynn said, mutually beneficial and not exploitative of um, the knowledge that's in communities, the um, information that's in communities that's kind of being extracted all the time. Um, so just really thinking about how um, you are building power with communities as well as researching um, and how folks can have more say and have more power in um, the direction of the research and how research is collected and the analyzation of the research, um, making sure that information gets back to folks that you're um, working with. So many times, you know, people are researched or <laughs> are studied and um, you really have no idea where that information goes and you never kind of know <laughs> what came of it. Um, so we're working on a kind of those best practices, um, especially for communities that um, are kind of at the margins um, and have historically been um, under-researched and also research has been used um, in an impressive way. So just some things to think about <laughs> as well. And I think that's really, th those are really important points, Erica, and we see, I think one of the new um, words or terms we hear a lot, phrases, is uh, public criminology. And when I look at that, I think, well, that's basically what, it really has its roots in communities of color, the idea of respecting the community from which you're getting research, and as you said, bringing that research back to the community so that they understand what's, you know, they're not just the subject or object of it, but they're also a, a true participant and what the what's being the work that's being done, and I think, as you mentioned, a lot of the understudied groups we um, unfortunately don't always do do as, as researchers. We don't do as good of a job as we should in that. So I think it's important for our our practitioner uh, partners to to keep us um, keep us mindful of that. And uh, if if the researcher isn't, uh, hopefully everyone's engaged with that. But I think uh, uh, knowledge is power, and uh, I want our practitioners to be be empowered uh, through through data and through understanding it. So we'll go back to to, to go along that note. We will uh, talk a little bit about. Oops, I get this 
the one here? Okay. Um, some of the, the uh, IPV uh, data sources that uh, I wanted to go over, um, basically I'll, I'll talk about a few of these and we're going to, just so you know where we're going, we're going to focus on the, the NISVIS and the, the UCR data uh, for this uh, session. But, um, you know, two sources of where we can get information are from surveys. Typically, we think of victim surveys, especially from my perspective, I do a lot of uh, research on, on victim groups, but you could also survey service providers, you could survey um, offenders and that sort of thing, so there's other ways of, of getting that kind of uh, survey-based knowledge. And two examples from that that um, I imagine people are familiar with, uh, based on the initial um, surveys of the, before the pre-webinar, is uh, the National Intimate Partner and Sexual Violence Survey, or NISVIS. And that is one that is conducted by the Center for Disease Control. And it was started in 2010 and has been uh, basically uh, asked uh, pretty much every year since then. I'm going to be focusing on the 2010 data for this particular uh, webinar. But basically it focuses on um, intimate partner violence, sexual violence, and also stalking for uh, people aged 18 and older. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment, but just wanted to give you an overview here of these different sources. Another that I imagine many people have heard of is the National Crime Victimization Survey, the NCVS. That's one that's been fielded or uh, sponsored by uh, the Bureau of Justice Statistics in the uh, Department of Justice. Um, originally started back in 1972. It's been uh, revised uh, in 1992, and they're certainly and they're currently working on a, a revision of it right now. What we call that is an omnibus crime survey, so it's not focused just on IPV, but other types of, of victimization. And it was obviously, divided, we were asking victims, so I say we, the Bureau of Justice Statistics was asking uh, victims about uh, crime, so it was aimed to get that dark figure of crime that you wouldn't get at with uh, just police data. And that's asked of victims or household members age 12 and older. And then finally, I call this administrative-based data. And that's, all that means is that it's based on information that was collected for some administrative purpose. Um, the Uniform Crime Reporting Program is based on police data, but we also have data, administrative database systems that are based on uh, medical data, uh, emergency room, emergency department data, um, court data, if we're interested in correctional issues, you know, correctional data, that sort of thing. So, um, so it can be different uh, sources, but it's just basically those data were collected for an administrative uh, purpose and we're using them for um, knowledge about um, victims in our, our case here. And the one that uh, I'll be focusing on is the Uniform Crime Reporting Program which uh, goes back to 1929 as a summary system, which was just basically general counts. And what we'll be focusing on in this webinar is uh, the National, the National Incident-Based Reporting System, or, or NIBRS, because it gives us the incident details that allows us to study, um, the, uh, study IPV. And as I said, I'll be focusing on NISVIS and the UCR. One reason is because um, uh, the NCVS is uh, currently starting to collect uh, information about sexual orientation and gender identity. They have, um, most recent iteration I saw, they hadn't started releasing some of that data yet, but that's on the horizon. And they're also going to be start, they're going to start collecting more information about services. But right now, the survey that probably has the most information about services and also uh, sexual orientation for the purposes of our our webinar here is uh, is NISVIS, so we're going to focus on that uh, that going forward. So uh, go on those two the data sources. And before we go on to looking at each one uh, specifically, um, I wanted to ask you all. I know some of you uh, mentioned this in your uh, pre uh, webinar survey about what data sources have you used. But I was just kind of curious. We wanted to get a little bit of audience participation here about the the data sources that you've used, and I'll leave it up to you if you want to, um, uh, however you want to interpret uh, using those, using data. So put the poll up there, I guess. And we'll give you a little, just a few, a little bit of time to check off as many as you've uh, utilized in whatever way, however you want to interpret that term. <clears throat> 
I feel like we should have the Jeopardy music going on here for the, <laughs> the, the final Jeopardy. Okay, so if we close that poll, we'll see if we get those results. Alrighty, so it looks like we've got quite a few people who have uh, worked with or have experience with uh, the uh, NCBS and a little bit, of, seems like second is our NISVIS. So we've got some people with NISVIS and also some with the, the UCR. It seems like we have fewer people with uh, NIBR, so good. I hope that give you some information about that, but uh, we'll go forward here. And um, what I wanted to do before we went to each data set specifically, I thought it'd be useful to give an overview of both of uh, the uh, NISVIS and the UCR uh, NIBRIS and do those side by side, because I thought that might be an interesting way of, of kind of highlighting what each does. And also the idea that you can kind of see for your own purposes, kind of start thinking about um, how you might use these data about what might be a, a strength or a weakness. And again, neither one of these is all uh, is all good or all bad, however you want to put that. They're just different, and they collect data in different ways, and they give different information. So it really does depend on the purpose that you're using the data, which one might be the best resource for you and your purposes. So for, um, as again, I've got the side-by-side -side comparison. I'm going to take just a, a few minutes here to go, go through this chart so you understand what I'm talking about here. But uh, so with NISVIS, what I view, I call that a public health perspective, and UCR NIBRS is a criminal justice perspective. And this basically just has a way of how they're going to interpret, how they interpret what IPV is. Public health perspective uses violence as a public health problem, as, as a health issue, and collects data kind of with that perspective. And the UCR looks at criminal justice, you know, violence is something the criminal justice system addresses, and collects data through that system. And so that's why with NISVIS, it's going to be a perpetrator orientation. Everything is about um, that relationship the person had and what went on in that relationship, whereas the UCR views it as an incident, a specific incident. The police come in, they are dealing with that specific incident, and then they leave. And if they get called back to a, a later incident, they, they, they come back to that incident. But with uh, NISVIS, again, the public health perspective, they view um, IPV as an ongoing event, an event of continuous duration. You're in a state of, you know, of that, with that a perpetrator of um, intimate partner violence kind of an ongoing uh, situation. And again, uh, the UCR is a, a discrete incident. And then this is, again, it's a survey, so it's asking behavior-specific questions. Um, it's asking those of adult respondents, 18 and older. It's limited to IPV, sexual violence, and stalking, again, through behavior-specific questions to identify uh, those types of things. And for example, for the um, definitions of, of IPV, it includes physical violence and also psychological aggression, so issue, uh, behavior related to coercive control and expressive aggression. So it kind of has a broad view of, of intimate partner violence, both the type of offenses and also the, the who's included the intimate. I'll talk about those in just a minute. And it gets a lot of information about the victim, as most surveys do, because they're asking of that person. So you can get a lot of information about um, health issues. Again, from a public health perspective, one of the things NISVIS is interested in is, is health issues and the kind of the repercussions of, of uh, intimate partners, sexual violence, or stalking on a person's health. And they measure sexual orientation by asking the respondent to, to give that information and kind of compare that again with um, the UCR NIBRS on the other side. It's all ages. It's what we call, again, the omnibus crime collection. So it's, you know, 52 different crimes, although for intimate partner violence, we'll look at uh, aggravated assault, uh, simple assault and intimidation, although you could include other, other crimes in that if you, if you wanted to. And that uh, it's got a more narrow definition of, of intimates. We'll talk about that in just a minute. Uh, fewer victim details. And the sexual orientation is inferred from the intimate partner uh, victim offender relationship. So it's 
uh, we have to make some uh, assumptions uh, there because currently it's the uh, UCR NIBRS isn't collecting sexual um, orientation or uh, gender identity, although my understanding is that currently at the um, Office of Budget and Management, or Management and Budget, excuse me, OMB, that they are, that's one of the issues before them, if they give the okay for the FBI to collect that information, the FBI is, um, you know, able to do that. So that's kind of the, the logistics right now, but that's something that is, uh, my understanding, that's something that is of interest to the FBI to collect that, that information uh, for these purposes to get uh, better information here. And uh, just to, again, that, that sexual orientation, gender identity uh, issue is something I do want to make a caveat about when we're talking about data and also when you're looking at different data sets, that, uh, that, that tends to be a challenge with a lot of the um, national data sets and also if you see you know, kind of state and local uh, data sets that you might uh, uh, run into. That, uh, as many of you might know, the best practice is really to ask about uh, sexual orientation and gender identity separately. Some of our federal surveys, as I mentioned, um, NCBS is starting to do that. They're starting to adopt that uh, both the uh, ability to, and the, you know, going through the, the, the channels that uh, allow them to, to ask these questions, um, and also to get, to get that permission, and also to start asking the questions. So they're slowly adapting, adopting both the, um, the best practice and the ability to, to ask these questions. Um, but it's, it is important to, when you look at a data set to understand how a different data collection might measure it or not measure uh, sexual orientation and gender identity. One of the issues with NISVIS, for example, the 2010 data, they kind of collapsed um, sexual orientation and gender identity together, which is not best practice, but uh, they, you know, I, I think they've been revising that in, in later iterations. But it is important to understand um, how to um, how a, a data collection is, is is collecting that information for for your purposes, um, Erica. I don't know if you wanted to add anything on uh, measuring uh, sexual orientation or gender identity. Yeah, I can um, be quick. I just wanted to also um, flag that folks who or organizations that. Um, are funded by FIPSA, um, the Family Violence Prevention Act. Um, it is now required for organizations that are funded to ask about sexual orientation and gender identity. Um, and we're working to um, make sure that um, SOGI data is, um, is something that in VAWA and in other um, kind of big grant um, they grant um, kind of blocks that uh, that data is required of organizations, regardless if they're um, an LGBT specific org or a mainstream org. Great, super. Thank, thank you, Erica. And so I just want to kind of uh, push on. I know we're kind of um, got get, get, get moving with the presentation here. So, um, but basically, so what I want to do is kind of give a little bit more get, for each data set, give us some information about uh, the cases that are included, some patterns, and also the responses to IPV that you can get from each data set. So we'll just kind of move along to talk about NISVIS, first of all. And one of the things I wanted to do, first of all, is just to give you an idea of who's in the sample and the underlying numbers. So you can kind of see uh, with, again, we're trying to get these um, uh, nationally representative uh, data sets. But what happens is even with a data set like NISVIS, so you can see it has over 18,000 respondents, we still get um, fairly small numbers. And these are just, uh, these aren't people who've been victimized. These are just the overall sample. So the number of respondents that when we look at sexual minorities starts to be uh, somewhat small. And you'll also notice that the unknown is quite large. And that was because of how the data were collected in this first iteration of NISVIS in 2010. So basically the first half of the survey, the first six months of the survey was in uh, being asked of people, they only asked the sexual orientation question to people who indicated that they were engaging in any same-sex sexual activity. So um, after six months, they realized they, sh they shouldn't be doing that. They should be asking this of everyone. So that does um, provide us with um, somewhat uh, limited, you know, half the sample did not specifically get those, those questions. So um, just wanted to, to kind of give you a little bit of background with regard to the uh, sample characteristics there. 
And then when we're looking at race and ethnicity, again, when we kind of, this again is the overall sample, so you can think about if we had, since we only had, uh, we had, you know, 192 uh, female bisexual individuals in the survey. So you can kind of get an idea that once we start breaking it down by race, ethnicity, and then some of the um, race, ethnicity options where the cells were too small to report, we just got, you know, they were just uh, too few people to really, uh, to analyze those, those data. So you can kind of see that we're starting to get into small cell sizes to really, for the overall sample, let alone the, the victim sample that we'll talk about in just a second here. But you can see that this is um, a largely uh, white uh, sample that we have. And then with regard to age, again, this is the overall age of the um, NISBIS sample. And if you look at, I think the thing, one thing that uh, kind of uh, jumps out to me is the fact that for the 18 to 25 year old age group, which is kind of your emerging adults, your uh, college and immediately post-college age uh, individuals, it's the female bisexuals, you see that that is a much higher percentage of uh, young women who are identifying as, as female bisexual in this, particular, um, in this particular data set. So that just gives you a little, little bit of a handle on who's in these uh, data. And then also then, you know, how IPV is being measured. And this is a good question, again, as we were talking about how we measure uh, sexual orientation and gender identity, knowing how we measure um, IPV is really important when we look at uh, any kind of data set. So here for NISVIS, how we define IPV, both the relationships, so there's a list of, a, they range from spouse to uh, basically somebody you were having sex with, kind of hooking up to um, a perpetrator uh, intimate at the time of the first incident, because again, we're talking about the perpetrator relationship could change over time. So this is just how um, I opted to, to measure it for this particular, uh, the findings I'll show to you. And then um, the forms of behavior, we talked about that, and the time frame. So I'm going to be focusing on the past 12 months, but if you've viewed or utilized a NISBIS data previously, you've seen the CDC reports, and the CDC reports were focused on lifetime prevalence. So that's a slightly different, uh, the patterns tend to be the same, but it's a slightly different uh, uh, measurement there. And um, Eric, I didn't know if you wanted to, um, had any comments about the patterns of um, measuring IPV? Yeah, I can quickly um, just say with NCAVP, when we are collecting our data, um, we, I think, define IPV relationships the same way, um, and I think with just behavior, um, recognizing that um, it's a pattern of control and um, a pattern of one person's life is getting much smaller and isolated, um, and also just including economic violence, cultural violence, um, or cultural abuse, and isolation and intimidation as well. Okay, great, great. Thank you, Erica. I appreciate that. So when we're looking at, so for NISVIS, and again, this is the, for the 2010 data, and this is IPV in the past 12 months. So when we look at those who identified, who indicated that they had uh, experienced any of that physical or, or psychological um, aggression, we're seeing that uh, female bisexuals are the group that experience IPV the most frequently. So that's, and that's similar, it's a similar pattern with what the CDC found in their data for lifetime preference. Uh, prevalence, but this is just in the uh, 12, past 12 months. And also when we look at the female bisexuals and we see, you know, what's that, um, the, the sex dyad with regard to who they're saying the perpetrator is, uh, kind of doing a little bit of a, a background in that, we're seeing that 90% um, of, the, of the female bisexuals who indicated that they were um, a, a victim of IPV said that their perpetrator was a male. So they were lined up much closely with uh, female heterosexuals. And this is in contrast with male bisexuals who is about one third who indicated it was a, a male perpetrator and two thirds who said it was a female perpetrator. So it's a slightly different. So that's just, a, again, we don't know a lot about uh, uh, IPV among uh, bisexual individuals. So these details are, are helpful to, to learn. And so then with regard to the underlying behavior for IPV, we're seeing that most, um, the, the, that psychological aggression, that's the coercive control and uh, the, uh, the, um, uh, the psychological, uh, other kinds of psychological aggression 
are the most commonly experienced by the uh, individuals who are reporting IPV in um, the NISVIS uh, data set, and this is consistent across uh, sexual orientation. And to just uh, summarize here, again, we're seeing um, this really the uh, female bisexuals who have the highest uh, percentage of IPV. And um, Erica, I didn't know if you wanted to bring in some of your experiences about why these numbers might be so high. Sure. Um, I can provide a little bit of context. Um, kind of the two main factors that we're really seeing um, contributing to IPV, especially um, with male perpetrators against um, bisexual women um, is bi erasure and biphobia. Um, and the thing with bi erasure is that a lot of times people might say like, oh yeah, the lesbians and the gays or the queers and not really including specifically bisexual people. Um, and that happens both um, in mainstream organizations and also in LGBTQ specific organizations. Um, and so, there's not a lot of um, just, yeah, visibility. Um, and then biphobia also where bisexual folks are, you know, hypersexualized, are kind of just told that they're confused and they should pick a side or like all those different um, stereotypes and um, yeah, just things that people in society that just think about uh, bisexual people. Um, comes into play and a lot of times what we see with um, folks who come in and seeking services is that um, kind of the violence starts when they come out to their partner um, as being bisexual. Um, so that is also one of the reasons why we're thinking that it's um, more like men perpetrating as women. Um, and then some of just like the instances of violence might look like um, kind of restricting um, like female survivor or victims of um, like hanging out with their female friends because their partner be, thinks that they're going to sleep with everyone or um, threatening to out them to other people um, or even if there are children involved um, using the fact that they're bisexual against them in a court case and things like that. So just, um, just a little bit of context about um, why those numbers are so high. Great, great. Thanks so much, Erica. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. um, and so when we, now that we have, so one of the benefits of NISVIS, as I mentioned before, is that um, we get a lot more information as far as it's probably the, the best data source uh, nationally, giving information about both help seeking or disclosure and also services. And so this is just to give a little bit of information about the, the, the questions or the data that NISVIS collects with regard to services, obviously victims might seek uh, many more types of services uh, that, or, or I'm sorry, the help seeking might seek help from um, many other types of uh, forms of help, but uh, these are the ones that, that um, NISVIS uh, specifically asks about. So um, both can divide them up into to formal um, and, and informal uh, type of um, help. And then just to kind of here, mentioned here, that um, one of the most common things that we see with regard to help seeking, again, these are from people who indicated that they experienced IPV in the past uh, 12, 12 months, that we see that um, male IPV, IPV victims um, are comparable in their percentages of not seeking help, um, as are females, so, uh, but uh, males tend not to seek help. We, we don't see a lot of help seeking with regard to males, whether they're male heterosexuals, uh, gay males, or bisexual males. And then we're also seeing similar patterns of help seeking from uh, female heterosexual and bisexual IPV victims. So we're seeing uh, common similarities here. I know some of the percentages look um, similar, but uh, one of the issues here is, again, we were had pretty small numbers, so the, the confidence intervals to for statistical testing purposes uh, doesn't always indicate that there's a, a, a difference there, but the, the differences I mentioned with regard to the um, male IPV victims being comparable and the female heterosexual and bisexual victims, those are uh, significant, so those are um, something that, that's, uh, that, that test out uh, statistically. Um, and then who you seek uh, help from they, uh, this gives a little bit of information. The most common uh, sources 
for IPV uh, victims when they did seek help were a friend or a counselor. And I'm contrasting that a little bit with regard to police, because we'll be talking about police uh, information in just a second here with regard to, to, to NIBRS. Um, and they were also asked how helpful was that resource. And when uh, IPV victims went to friends or went to counselors, they indicated that they found those resources very helpful. So those were uh, very useful um, to them. And um, I don't know, uh, Erica, if you have uh, have found similar uh, uh, experiences in, in, in your work or, or not. Um, yeah, usually, um, I don't really know if we measure kind of friends, but um, definitely folks who are seeking services, talking to a counselor, um, we see that folks definitely find that more helpful um, than going to the police, especially, um, you know, like trans folks, black folks, the document, like all the um, folks who are kind of at the margins um, usually find those encounters to be much less helpful. Um, and harm, more harm, harmful than helpful. Okay. And we'll talk about that a little bit more when we get to the, the NIS yeah. data, okay, sorry, the NIBRS data, um, especially given the kind of the legacy of policing in um, both communities of color and also um, more marginalized uh, populations. So we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more. And then the, just, sorry, my computer's freezing up here. Um, the, so the services that uh, NISBIS asks about, so it's, um, you've got five different types of services. Again, there could be other services that people are accessing. Um, these are the ones that are collected by, by NISBIS. And what we find for those who've been uh, victims of intimate partner violence in the past year is that the vast majority are not indicating um, they're seeking help at the, at least at that point. So that's not, uh, they're not indicating help seeking at, at, or services at that point. I'm kind of comparing it with uh, the help seeking just so you can kind of see uh, what, what uh, uh, IPV victims are doing uh, in response or at least at this point. And again, this could be um, you know, that it's just been, the, been in the past 12 months and maybe people seek services at, at a later point, but at, the, at least at this snapshot with regard to uh, needing victim services, uh, this is where uh, the, the, what the victims are, are reporting in, in NISVIS. So that's, uh, so this just kind of sums up, with, up what we've been talking about with regard to, to NISVIS, um, kind of again, the most are, are seeking help rather than uh, gain services. Male victims tend not to seek uh, help or disclose their IPV. And when people do uh, seek help, uh, friends and counselors are, are, quite, uh, are quite helpful there. Uh, before we go on to NIBRS, if people want to um, indicate uh, kind of in the chat box that uh, kind of a, an additional detail from a data source, whether it's NISVIS or a survey or, or police data, feel free to put that in the in the chat box. We can use that in uh, a little bit of discussion. Hopefully we'll have a little time for that. Um, but while we're doing that, I'm going to move on to talk about the NIBRS data set. And few, uh, some of you had less, uh, oops, I'm sorry, look kind of Go ahead there. Uh, well, that, some had experience with NIBRS data. I'll kind of give a little bit of an overview of this, which is, um, you know, NISVIS uh, indicated that few victims report or otherwise disclose to the police, but uh, NIBRS does give a picture of those who do re report IPV to the police, um, either themselves or another person. Somehow it comes to the attention of the police. And that uh, basically uh, NIBRS uh, collects the uh, details of the incident, as well as victim and offender uh, demographics. The FBI is in the process of converting its summary traditional UCR crime data into the NIBRS or the incident-based format. By um, January 1st, 2021, the FBI will only be accepting incident-based data. So it, the sun will set on aggregate, aggregated data um, in the UCR format. Um, right now, we've got 17 states that are solely giving NIBRS data. We have 21 that are, some are submitting NIBRS data. So we've got uh, a bunch of states that will be needing to get on board in the next uh, year and a half or so. But uh, if you recall that we don't currently, uh, FBI doesn't collect um, SOGI information uh, right now, so we 
do have to rely on intimate partner and sex dyad when we're looking at um, NIBRS uh, data. And as uh, Erica mentioned, uh, one of the issues also with uh, IPV reported to the police is when we're looking at um, communities of color and also communities that have been traditionally marginalized, uh, the police uh, data can undercount those communities if they're not, uh, if people are not feeling comfortable uh, accessing uh, police uh, information uh, right here. And we can talk about that in just uh, in, in a minute, uh, a little bit more if, if people are interested in that. Some summary of what NIBRS can tell us um, is, and this is based on the 2016 data. So um, looking at uh, police reported IPV, and this is looking across four sex dyads, so that is um, female victim, male offender, male victim, female offender, so those would be our hetero, what we would probably call our heterosexual uh, couples, and then our, our same-sex couples, which is um, male victim, uh, male offender, and female victim, female offender. For all of these sex dyads, we're seeing similar patterns with regard to uh, about 75% involve a simple assault as opposed to um, uh, uh, aggravated assault or, or um, intimidation, and 75% occur at home. Uh, and then also about half uh, involve an arrest, and that uh, for our, uh, our same-sex couples, that's about 53, 56% that uh, report an arrest. And for our female victim, female offender IP dyads, we have slightly different patterns. They tend to be, the victims tend to be slightly younger, so 30 years old versus mid-30s or, or, or um, uh, later 30s uh, for other uh, victim dyads. And then a slightly higher percentage of the victims are um, black. And I want to focus a little bit on race is because the police data, they have, they're limited, but they do provide enough uh, cases that we are able to disaggregate uh, for the past year uh, that we weren't able to do with the, the NISVIS data. So I wanted to give a couple examples of that with regard to um, the race, uh, and here you can again see those, those uh, IPV, IP uh, dyads, uh, sex dyads I was talking about. So male victim, female offender, female victim, male offender, male victim, male offender. And then if you look at the female victim, female offender, which is highlighted in yellow there, you can see that that um, we're seeing uh, kind of almost a closer uh, comparison of uh, a white, black, uh, breakdown than we are with some of the other um, dyads that we're, we're looking at there. And then with regard to arrests, we're seeing that cases that involve a black um, victim, we're seeing fewer arrests in those cases. And Erica, I don't know if you wanted to, to come in and, and make some comments with regard to uh, communities of color and uh, kind of arrest patterns. Yeah, for sure. Um, so something that we see, especially with um, same-sex couples um, or same-gender couples, um, is that there's the person who may be more like masculine presenting. Um, if it's a like if it's a female couple, um, is usually assumed to be the aggressor, and the person who's more like femme presenting is assumed to be the survivor, and that's not always the case. And sometimes um, the kind of aggressor or perpetrator can use that against um, the survivor in order to further their um, abuse and victimization. Um, and we also see generally, um, I know the data is not there in that, in this um, set, but with um, especially trans folks and like black trans women um, are much higher, are at much higher risk of being harassed and um, further victimized by police when they um, do have interactions or people, police not taking them seriously um, when they do try and report. Um, so those are some of the things that we're definitely seeing and just a general like higher criminalization of um, LGBTQ folks, especially folks of color um, in general. 
Okay, great. And I appreciate you giving that, that context, um, Erica, because I think it's an important perspective to have. And one thing I just realized when I, I, I should have mentioned with regard to when we're doing the breakdown with regard to race, uh, some of you might be wondering um, what, where, what about our, our uh, colleagues in the Latino community, our, uh, where the Hispanic, uh, the Hispanic race, and one of the limitations with the uh, with NIBRS data is it doesn't um, consistently report Hispanic um, ethnicity. So when we're it's hard to break that out in a victim race ethnicity context. So we're we're um, limited on looking at that as you know, um, without including um, Hispanic in, in that context. And just a kind of a final uh, kind of takeaway points here with regard to the two uh, data sets. Um, again, as I mentioned, um, that uh, the NISVIS provides uh, questions about sexual orientation and really highlights the, the need to better understand bisexual victims and gives us a lot more information with regard to help seeking and use of services and provides a lot more detail than we've had in other national uh, data sets there. And then with NIBRS, we do get that uh, focusing on police data. We get kind of larger case numbers, so we can kind of uh, drill down a little bit, but we do have less information uh, going on there. Um, my guess is that probably with uh, NIBRS, that might be a data set that you would have more access to, especially I know the FBI is uh, working on uh, data tools. There's some available right now that you can use to, to analyze the NIBRS data, but there are fewer details than, than on NISVIS. And then, of course, looking ahead, um, NCVS has some very exciting changes that are occurring, especially for those of us interested in um, uh, uh, issues about uh, sexual orientation and gender identity, collecting that information and uh, also adding some additional victim service information uh, there. So um, before we open it up to a discussion and questions, Erica, I don't know if you had any last, last comments you wanted to make. I know we're a little bit over time. I appreciate people's uh, patience here, but. Uh, yeah, I feel like we can definitely get to the questions. Um, I definitely want to make space for that for folks. Okay, great. Um, Lynn, if you can advance to the next oh, sure question can. slide. And folks, we are going to go ahead and open the exit poll. As I mentioned, we really do need your responses to this survey, so we want to make sure that you have the chance to give those answers if you have to go. Um, Lynn, a number, and Erica, a number of questions have already come in, and one of the things you're going to find is that people have a whole lot of ideas about additional research that is needed. Excellent. I love that. <laughs> Um, one question was, is there data linking IPV and suicide attempts or completions with this population, presumably? I don't know of any data specifically linking IPV in LGBTQ communities and suicide or suicide attempts and completion. Um, there's definitely data in general about LGBTQ youth specifically um, and suicide attempts and suicide completion um, that may have some IPV in there, but I'm not sure. Gosh, that's, that's a really good question. And uh, I don't have the NISVIS uh, questionnaire in front of me. I do know that they do ask about certain health questions. I don't think they ask about suicide attempts, but they they might, I know they ask about other kind of mental health questions. Um, so I, uh, um, that might be the closest that you get, but I, but I, I appreciate that question because I think that's a, that's a really good one. Okay, another question. Um, are, are, is there any data on gender nonconforming or non-binary? I know you said that these two sources were not, um, didn't have that. But is there anything out there that people can look to? Yes. Um, there's the NCVP um, data. There is some institute data. I know the um, HRC has a report that they also release every year, um, especially around um, IPV homicides um, that um, focus mainly on trans and gender nonconforming and non-binary folks. And we can send that around too. Great. 
Excellent. I have to say that's why we have Erica on the, <laughs> on the webinar because, um, as I said, I learn from I, – I, I love the practitioners because I feel like I learn so much. So <laughs> I appreciate that, Erica. Yes. Is there any data on instances where both parties are arrested in LGB um, IPV incidents, both the victim and the perpetrator? Yes. There is definitely data on that as well. Um, what we see a lot of times is that, A, there might be like mandatory arrest policies um, where people are, like both parties are arrested. There may be, um, just police don't really know how to discern what's happening, so they just arrest both people. Um, so there is data on that, and I can try and find some reports that um, highlight that for folks. And that's also something with um, with NIBRS because they do the one thing that police can give you a lot of information on is arrests, and uh, they um, they do you can look at things at the incident level and get information if both people were arrested. And again, the caveat there is that you will be limited to the you know intimate partner and sex dyad, so you won't know specifically. You can make the assumption that it's a same sex partnership. You don't know whether those individuals would identify as um, a particular sexual orientation, and also it would undercount um, anybody who would identify as bisexual. Great. Here's another question. Is there information that includes gender, um, I'm sorry, there, there might be a word missing here. That I'll, I'll read it straight. Um, is there info that includes gender this biphobia mirrors the transphobia, lack of recognition, and underreporting slash representation identity as it pertains to the transgender population. I know that's a little confusing. I think um, I think the questioner was typing quickly. Um, if I understand the question as is there um, data on folks who identify as trans and bisexual, um, we definitely, like, that's underrepresented, um, even in, like, LGBTQ research. Um, but we, I think, as a field, we're getting better at um, trying to figure that out. All right, here's another question. Are there statistics on victims of IPV LGB that were not able to file reports or obtain services due to the language barrier? Hmm. Good question. That is a good question, and, and some of that. No, I, I say that because um, the with NISVIS is is, is for um, both English and Spanish speaking, so that you know anyone mm -hmm. who is not um, a speaker of one of those two languages would automatically be left out of that kind of. So I'm thinking even to collect information on some of those uh, whether whether the language barrier that's not one of the two language uh, languages that would be somebody who'd be um, left out because because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uh, they do ask um, the NISVIS, one of the questions they asked is if you uh, if you needed services and if you needed them and you could not get them why mm. and so if but the problem would be that uh, if it's somebody who's I mean, you get that if, if somebody was who spoke Spanish uh, was not able to but any other language we would miss that and I have a feeling that that might be more common um, with other languages, perhaps. I don't know. All right. We got um, a couple of questions about um, the difficulties and or, or issues in determining the, the primary aggressor. So one question, and they're related, <laughs> so I'll, I'll ask both. What are best practices for determining primary aggressor um, mm -hmm. in, the, in a same-sex relationship? Um, and that person says, typically, I think most agencies tend to Open which open whichever individual makes contact first, but are there other suggestions? And someone else is wondering if there is data on arrest rates of victims in LGB relationships as opposed to dual arrests, arrest rates on victims. So those are somewhat related. Oh, sorry, I thought I muted myself when I did it. Um, so in regards to the first question, there are definitely best practices um, the Institute has a really good assessment um, webinar and guide 
um, to determine um, who's the primary aggressor, a lot of it is taking the time to talk to both people in the relationship um, and ask very like, specific questions to really figure out, again, like whose world is getting smaller um, and who's being more isolated um, in regards to, yeah, in, in the relationship to see um, who's the primary aggressor and who um, is the victim. And um, we can turn around some more of the resources. Um, in regards to the second question about survivor <laughs> arrest rates, um, we do have some of those, I believe, in the NCAVP report. Um, but it's, again, a under-researched area. We had another data question. Um, are there any data on um, whether certain, whether there are certain areas, and presumably geographic areas, where there is more um, IPV in the LGBT uh, or LGB community than in others. Is NIBRS far enough along where you can make some geographic distinctions or NISFIS, or are the data sets too small? That's too small. Well, this is, would probably be too small because it's a national. Um, they, now they do have state. They do kind of. They are supposed to be able to make state estimates, but I mean, once you start um, kind of subdividing it by sexual orientation, that might be. They might not. It might. You might lose power to to get those kinds of estimates at the state level. I don't know. I haven't worked with it at that level. Um, with NIBRS, um they, the, one of the issues going on, one of the questions right now is whether we, they would want to start geocoding uh, uh, um, incidents, oh, just all of all crime incidents. Some states do have geocoded data, and some police departments do. If you look on their websites, for example, some police departments are very good about indicating where certain incidents you know, have occurred. Those tend to be a bit more. Um, Eric, they don't necessarily say this was a IPV involving uh, a, you know, a same sex or opposite sex uh, couple. Um, but if it, the, I imagine that those those data might be out there. I don't know of a particular study uh, or a particular collection that's already kind of existing that would provide that information. Well, yeah, as I indicated, indicated. Oh no, go ahead, Erica, please. No, I was just going to um, say that I think most of the information that we also get when we see trends, we mainly like look at the homicide trends. Um, and when the only thing that we really noticed was Florida had um, a lot of um, oops, sorry, <laughs> um, a lot of IPV-related homicides, um, especially of Black trans women. But that's the only trend that we have seen so far in the data. Well, as I indicated, a lot of the questions are just illustrating how badly we need additional data in this area. Um, <laughs> and I can foresee future researcher practitioner partnerships to try to delve into some of this. And I would also recommend to uh, people who are interested, to the extent that you want data collected, please, um, please advocate for that with your representatives with your, um, you know, that as a state, uh, local, federal level, um, because um, oftentimes I think agencies do want to provide it. It's the you know, one getting the funding and uh, the support to do that. So I think uh, it's not that there's a resistance to doing it. It's often a matter of, 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 of money. So I would recommend uh, to people that that's also a, um, something that uh, to, to consider. And if they are, they're advocating for a lot of different uh, things, but that you can put that on your, on your list as well. <laughs> well, Lynn and Erica, I want to thank you so much for spending the afternoon with us. I think um, all of us have learned a lot about the data that's, that is available and what we would like to see. So thank you. Susan, well, so move it one more thing. If you sure. Reply. I realized I had the slide that has both of our contact information. So to the extent that uh, I'm sure I think Erica feels as, as I do, which is if we can be of assistance or, or support, we're happy to yep. have our, our contact information shared with everyone participating today. Yes. 
All right. Thank you, everyone, for attending today's webinar. Please do take our closing poll before you leave for the day and uh, check in about future webinars. Thanks so much, and goodbye, everyone.